Kaleidoscope is sponsored by the Afro-American Bookstore. Know me, understand that I'm in here unjustly. Our only agenda is to fight and ensure that David Rice and Edward Poindexter serve their full sentence. David Rice and Edward Poindexter had a trial by a uh, jury. The jury heard all the evidence, and the jury believed the testimony of Dwayne Peake. There are people who really believe that Ed and Manu did not do this. If there is a chance that that's true, do they want an innocent person in prison? We don't want them out here. <laughs> you know, people, I think people that commit murder, should, well, if they're given life, they should do life. It shouldn't be a, a six-year thing or a 25-year thing. It should be life. They should be taken out in a pine box. If my own father had been killed, I would want somebody to pay, uh, to pay a price. But um, I would want the right person to pay, to pay a price. David Rice and Ed Poindexter, convicted of killing Omaha policeman Larry Minert. After 27 years, the case continues to generate discussion, debate, and division. Today, a look at some of the questions surrounding the case of David Rice and Ed Poindexter. Welcome to a special hour-long edition of Kaleidoscope. For 27 years, our subject today has caused controversy. Last month, it even became an issue in the mayor's race. We're talking about the bombing death of policeman Larry Minert. A jury ruled that two men were responsible. Some people have serious questions about that verdict. Others remain convinced that the system indeed has the right men in jail. Today, we plan to do something that both sides advocate. We take a look at the record. And joining me are two individuals who have spent years researching this case. Kitrin Zeichel, who is a freelance journalist, producer, who has written extensively about this case. And to her right, Ben Gray, who usually hosts Kaleidoscope and who has done several documentaries on this subject. But before we begin our discussion, I want to begin by playing portions of an interview I did recently with Mondo Wilanga, formerly known as David Rice. People who want to keep talking about how long they want me to, to stay locked up and how many pine boxes of what they want me to come out in need to look at the record. Uh, they need to learn the truth. And, uh, you know, this case is in federal district court now. And in addition, as you know, an effort has been, is being made to, grant, you know, to, uh, to secure a, a hearing from uh, a Senate subcommittee. Uh, but like I say, the, um, uh, those people who talk a lot but have little information should get more information. Some truth has, has already come out, but it's not so much, it's not so much a problem of, of truth getting out, but truth getting out to enough people. Um, I mean, I've done a number, a number of interviews, and I, pre you know, I presented um, matters from the record, but a lot of these things had never gotten out over the airway. Um, how much truth will come out? Uh, I don't know, and it may not make any. It may wind up not making any difference how much truth comes out. Um, there's enough truth that has come out already, but I'm still locked up. In 1974, uh, Warren Urbaum of the Federal District Court reversed the conviction, told the state they had 90 days in which to retry me or let me go. The state appealed to the Eighth Circuit Court. Eighth Circuit Court said the same thing. State appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court didn't even rule on the merits of the case. They raised the question of jurisdiction, whether or not the Federal District court had the jurisdiction to make its ruling. It had had the jurisdiction all along, all of a sudden it no longer has jurisdiction. Yet the merits of the case that it ruled on were never touched. <coughs> but here I am, you know, here I am still locked up. So I don't know if, if the truth will make any difference at all, <laughs> just like Art O'Leary said. Um, so, see, I have, see, Mike, I have faith 
not in, 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 in the criminal justice system, because it is just that, a criminal justice system. You know, I have faith uh, in, in something invisible, in, in something that, 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 uh, that men or women, for all that go, can't provide. And maybe it's foolish. You know, I, I, I don't know. So I don't know whether the truth is going to make any difference or not. But I want people to know the truth. I also asked if he would ever confess to the crime if it meant he might be given his freedom. Uh, I, 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 don't even, <clears throat> I don't even have to uh, hesitate about it. Uh, my poor ass would die in here. Um, and um, see, because I, I ain't letting them off like that, <laughs> you know. So that, you know, they got money, you know, they got, you know, they got hundreds of thousands of dollars to work with. Let them do some investiga investigatory work and find out, you know, what, what, what's, what's, what's going on. Uh, but, you know, actually, though, if I had done that, if I had lied and said, well, yeah, I did it, uh, and I'm sorry, it ain't no great possibility, but it's a possibility I could have gotten out of here. Because as you remember, eight different dudes who came in here after I did, doing life sentence of first degree murder, have already gone. Um, but see, uh, see, a, a lot of people uh, in this society follow what I call the philosophy of expedience. You do whatever it is that you think is necessary to do to get done what you want done damn the morals or anything else, you know. And that's, that's the way a lot of people in the society operate, from business owners to politicians and so forth. Uh, I don't play that. You know, I got to feel right about myself. And uh, so, no, I wouldn't even have to hesitate on that. And first of all, Kitrin said she'd prefer to be known as an independent researcher. In that segment, he mentions that at least eight individuals who were convicted and went to prison after him have since been released. We know the number is closer to 26, 27. What makes this case so much different from some of the other cases? I think that there are several things that, that the one thing that makes it different, I think more than anything else, has to do with the fact that, you know, first of all, this is a police officer. But even more than that, um, we're, we're going to talk about later on, and, and I just want to begin right away by, you know, there seems to be a, a, a conspiracy. Uh, of, a, of tremendous magnitude that, that went on amongst and between Omaha police officers, uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, um, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, and a number of other people who were involved in a program uh, back during the 60s and early 70s called COINTELPRO, which was run by J. Edgar Hoover, who was the director of the FBI at the time. Um, and if if these men, if, if, if the story is actually allowed to be told and evidence uh, showing, you know, different discrepancies and so forth is allowed to come out, um, there are a number of agencies and organizations and people who are going to look bad in this. So the, the effort to continue to keep these individuals in jail by people, including but, but not exclusively Omaha police officers, is, is what I think drives the, the ongoing effort to keep these men behind bars. My understanding of the pardon and parole philosophy is that the purpose of prison is not really to punish people as much as to protect the public. And when you parole or pardon a first degree murderer, it's because you think you have determined that this individual is not a threat to society, and therefore you would rather have somebody in prison who is a threat and who should be currently incarcerated. And I was down at the penitentiary once, and one of the guards on my way out said to me, that guy doesn't belong in jail, because Mondo is really not a dangerous person, and, and he never was. Now he says, even if the truth comes out, he doesn't know if that would be enough to to, to get his release, to win his release from prison. Do you think he has a valid point? To a certain extent. I think if, if I, he also said if truth gets out to enough people, and if truth gets out to the right people, then, I mean, there's, there's a possibility that things could be turned around. But again, you're dealing with, see, you're not just dealing with a local agency. If you were, uh, there may be some there may be some movement or some, some, some willingness to move on the part of perhaps maybe some regional or federal agency
to do something about this. But when you include officers at the local level, individuals at the national level, uh, names and reputations of individuals who have long since passed on, uh, that makes it that much more difficult. And, and, and truth needs to come, I mean, truth needs to get to the right people, but once it gets to the right people, they have to act. Now, he says, well, go ahead. I didn't want to interrupt you there. <laughs> well, you know, the truth can come out, but then people have to believe the truth. And if people have invested a great deal of themselves in believing one story, sometimes it's more important to a person to be right than to admit the truth. So when I hear Mondo saying that, that's how I interpreted it, that even if the truth was known, people might not even believe the truth. Now, he says a lot of the facts are already out there. And one of the things that he is hoping people will, will just look at the information that is already out there. He's right. I mean, there's no <laughs> doubt about that. I mean, we did, we're going to play portions of a, mm -hmm. a British Broadcasting Company documentary in a few minutes. Um, I did an hour-long documentary uh, back in 1982 uh, in which we outlined so many different aspects of the case where there were a number of questions involved. Um, and, and the information is out there. Uh, it has not been, I agree with Mondo that it has not been aired the way that it should. In other words, enough enough journalists and, and people who pontificate on this case without doing the homework, you know, have not bothered to really examine it the way that they should. But there's been enough truth, there's been enough information, there's enough documented facts out there that warrant some sort of an investigation. But you talk about, I want to get back to something you talked about earlier. You mentioned the word conspiracy. Correct. And it seems that people have a hard time accepting the possibility of a conspiracy, especially at the governmental level. Well, I, I, I agree that they have a hard time with it, but, but, but the, there's all kinds of evidence. There's an FBI memo that, that uh, there's no other way to read it except that Omaha police officers and FBI knew about a tape uh, before and during the trial realized that that tape was not the voice of the, the star witness, Dwayne Peake, sent a memo to that effect to the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover at the time, saying that they wished no use of this tape be used. There's no other way to read that memo other than the FBI and Omaha police knew that this wasn't Dwayne Peake's voice, knew that Dwayne Peake was lying on oath, and, and what else do you glean from that other than we don't want this used because we want to convict these guys no matter what. No matter what it takes, no matter what laws we have to break, no matter what rules we have to bend, um, no matter whose arms we have to twist, we have to get these guys in jail at all costs. In the previous documentary that Ben made in 1982, there's a really priceless comment by Father Cunningham, who was Mondo's previous attorney. He passed away in 1986. But he said he didn't believe in conspiracy as much as he believed that there was a lot of klutzing around by the government. And I think that for people who don't uh, look at the facts and see a conspiracy, I think it's very easy to see a lot of klutzing around. Of course, I, I want to ask both of you. When you started your research into this, this case, were you surprised and what you found. <laughs> I, I, is, what I'm going to tell people is, is probably going to shock some people and, and, and surprise some others, but you know, when I started this case, when I started looking at it, I had a relative that was in the penitentiary. It happened to be a cellmate of Mondo's. And they asked me to look at this case. And my, my relative said that you've got to look at this case because they believe this guy is innocent. And in a condescending sort of way, I said, well, all you guys are innocent, aren't you? <laughs> You know, I mean, because, and, and that's kind of the mindset that I had, you know. So I wasn't really interested in doing this case when I started it. Um, and, you know, they finally got a copy of the preliminary hearing transcript to me. And it sat in my car for over a month, you know. And, and I finally said, one day I didn't have anything to do. I said, let me read this preliminary transcript so that I can get these guys out of my hair so I can say that I read it. Because, Mike, you and I... I mean, you know, as well as I do, how many calls we get from people in the penitentiary, and they tell us a story, we get involved, I mean, we start doing research, we find out only half the story is true. Well, that's happened so many times, you sort of get hardened to it to a certain extent. And I say, well, okay, I'm not going to, I mean, let me read the preliminary transcript, get it out of the way, be done with it. And I read the preliminary transcript, and when I got done with it, I even gave it to you to read, because I said, mm -hmm. I can't believe that this would happen in a city in this country in 1970. I, I just couldn't believe that 
someone would do this, that, that judges and prosecutors would act in this fashion. That's okay, how I got involved. Okay, hold that thought. We're going to take a break, and then we'll return and, and pick up with where we left off. Heritage. It makes individuals part of something greater. None should go without a sound knowledge of his or her people. After seven years in the making and in its first historical printing, the original African Heritage Study Bible is now available at the Afro-American Bookstore. The original African Heritage Study Bible is but one of the items that the Afro-American Bookstore offers to educate all about the contributions that people of color have made to the heritage that belongs to all of Earth's peoples. Visit the Afro-American Bookstore today. Our heritage awaits discovery. My name is John Tess. I'm a retired Omaha police officer. I was disabled August 17, 1970, by a suitcase bomb set by the Black Panther group in Omaha called the United Front Against Fascism. This group was founded and led by Ed Poindexter and David Rice. Rice and Poindexter had what they called, quote, a beautiful plan to kill a pig, unquote. And in their minds, that is what they did. They killed Officer Larry Menard by blowing him to pieces. The jury of three men and nine women agreed with the prosecution's evidence and the testimony of Dwayne Peake, the 15-year-old who Rice and Poindexter used to activate their beautiful plan to kill a cop. They sentenced Rice and Poindexter to life in prison with no parole. I agree with them wholeheartedly. It is not appropriate to con commute the sentence of a convicted cop killer. The city of Omaha suffered a great loss that night. So did I. But most of all, these members of Larry's family suffered and continue to suffer today because of a few vocal supporters, supporters of the Free Rice and Poindexter movement. These well-intended but misguided supporters come from the backgrounds of the arts, education, and the legal field. They all claim to know David Rice and Edward Poindexter. Well, I know them too. John Tess was Larry Minard's partner, and as you heard, he remains strongly convinced of the guilt of Rice and Poindexter. Now, many of his views are reflected in a recent editorial written by former World Herald publisher and now contributing editor Harold Anderson. In that editorial, Anderson says, I would suggest that the most logical way of advocating freedom for Rice and Poindexter is not to continue arguing that they are innocent. He goes on to say that Rice and Poindexter were found guilty by a jury whose verdict has been upheld by the Nebraska Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court, and that much has been made of the fact that their conviction depended in part on the testimony of a 15-year-old who said he was a participant in the bomb plot. Rarely mentioned is the fact there was strong corroborating evidence, including the finding of dynamite traces in rice and Poindexter's clothing. Now, you know, listening to that, I... I'm sure that there are a number of people who share those views when they, when they hear about this case. But listening to some of those points that were raised, they are not exactly accurate, are they? No. No, they're not accurate at all. First of all, when you talk about what the United States Supreme Court did, first of all, they never, as, as, as Mondo mentioned earlier, they never ruled on the merits of the case. Uh, they ruled as to whether they had jurisdiction to hear the case. They had had jurisdiction for years before that, so you know, they, they raised an issue that had not been raised in Mondo's case. The, 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 the U.S. Supreme Court themselves raised that issue. Um, and, and what they did that was even more amazing than that was they heard the Rice case. Then they heard a case called Stone versus Powell that had elements of maybe federal government may not have jurisdiction or whatever in it. They ruled in the Stone case and made it retroactive to David's case. So they did several things that were kind of unheard of for the court. Uh, but in ruling on the merits of the case and saying that they agreed with the 
the state Supreme Court of Nebraska, that never happened. Well, the comment that I would like to make, because there's so much in that segment that I could comment on, John Tess was actually partnered with a man named John Toy that night, and I think uh, Officer Minard was partnered with someone named Denny Moran. And Officer Tess was the most seriously injured uh, officer, aside from Officer Menard. They were both near the bomb when it exploded. And, uh, but when I'm listening to him talk about the jury, the jury actually made a pact, according to the World Herald, that they would never discuss what went on during the four days of deliberations. And in 1995, when I was here doing research, I called a couple of the jury members, and there were two women that spoke to me. One was a 90-year-old woman, and the question I posed to her was, why did the jury take so long to decide the verdict? And we're she told me... four days. They took, what, four, four days. days Wednesday right? to Saturday, I believe. Um, and she told me that there were people who felt they were innocent. And I said, well, who felt that they were innocent? And she said, me. The, case never, the state never proved their case. It was all circumstantial evidence. She told me that she did not believe Dwayne Peake. She didn't think that uh, he could have done uh, something like that on his own. And uh, when I pressed her to say, to repeat that on tape, she told me that she wouldn't repeat it on tape. She simply told it to me on the phone. I called another one of the female jurors and I asked her about the verdict. And she told me that she personally did feel that they were guilty. And it was the single black juror on the, um, on the jury who felt that they were innocent. And he was responsible for holding the jury up for those four days. And Ed Poindexter told me in a letter that uh, he had heard through the grapevine that this black juror agreed to vote guilty if the others would agree to spare their lives because evidently there were people on the jury who wanted to find them guilty and give them the death penalty. So um, Mondo and Ed escaped being killed because of one black juror on that, uh, on that jury panel. And who is, he's dead now, or else I, I would have called him and talked to him too. Um, but you know, who is to say uh, what really went on in, in that jury and whether or not that juror actually believed that they were guilty or if he simply uh, participated in what's called a compromised verdict. Now the editorial talked about, uh, it says how much is being made of Dwayne Peake's testimony, mm -hmm. but that was a critical piece of, of the prosecution's case, wasn't it? It was the major piece of the prosecution's case. In fact, if they had, ha had, if they had, had not had Dwayne Peake's testimony, um, they probably couldn't have brought that case to court. Uh, all of the other evidence was circumstantial. They talk about finding the dynamite. Uh, there were questions about whether that, not no questions, the, 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 f the federal judge in the state of Nebraska, Warren, Warren Erbaum, uh, overturned the case because he found the search, uh, the search warrant invalid, the search illegal. He found the testimony of particularly James Perry, one of the police officers, found his testimony in, in Warren Erbaum's wor words incredible for nine different reasons. So in other words, he had, you had a police officer that, that, that a federal judge didn't believe was credible, and the Eighth Circuit Court agreed with him. You had evidence that they believe was gathered. Um, first of all, they're, they're not even sure that the dynamite was ever in the house. They, the police officers took pictures of the dynamite when it was in the trunk of a car, but they never took dynamite, took, took pictures of the dynamite while it was allegedly in the house. So you have all this testimony that, that uh, uh, a federal judge didn't believe, the Eighth Circuit Court didn't believe, um, and all of this information um, led to the federal, courts, the, the federal courts at the appellate level doing what they did. Uh, they didn't believe the story of James Perry, they didn't believe the search was valid or the search warrant, search warrant valid, the search illegal. Uh, there are those who didn't believe that there was ever dynamite in that house. Obviously, a lot of people have a chance, have had a chance to, to read some of the court records and the court documents. How can so many people read this, the same court records, the same documents, hear some of the same arguments and come to such very different conclusions? I can answer that. <laughs> um, and I'll make, since I am an artist, I'll make a, an art analogy. There's a Japanese film called, um, it's by a filmmaker named Kurosawa, and in it there's rain at the beginning of this film and then you see a story unfold from one perspective and then it comes to a conclusion and then there's all this rain and you see the same story unfold again and it comes to an entirely different conclusion because it's from a different perspective and then you go back to all this rain and then you see the story unfold a third time from another completely different perspective that happens all the time people bring their own lives they bring their prejudices their beliefs their biases to some information and then in the bible when you read the bible it's called exegesis reading the meaning out from the text and everybody does their own kind of exegesis in life where you 
you read the meaning out of the text that you bring to it. It's very, very hard to be unbiased and be totally pure in, in anything. I mean, that happens all the time in, in court cases. But as you read the record, though, I mean, it, there are certain things in the record that jump out at you that you, that, that you have to red flag. In the preliminary hearing, for example, I, I bet you can't find not one single other case um, in this state where a witness comes out and says one thing in the morning. They, and you have to recall also that when Dwayne Peake first testified during the preliminary hearing, uh, David and Ed's point, Mondo and Ed's Poindex, Poindexter's attorneys asked for a recess because Dwayne Peake's attorney wasn't present. The judge denied uh, that motion for, for a recess until his attorney was present. Dwayne got on the stand and then he told essentially, no, they had nothing to do with it, no, they weren't involved, no, I didn't make a bomb with them, no, they were nowhere on the scene. And the prosecution calls, ask for a recess for really no apparent reason other than to confer with their client and that recess is granted. And then he comes back in the afternoon uh, clearly shaken, uh, clearly crying, clearly upset, um, and then he tells a different story. You can't find another case in this state where that happened. I mean, that's a red flag. Someone ought to, I mean, and that's what got me started when we talked about before the break. What got me started, and I couldn't believe that in 1970, in the United States of America, that there was a court that would allow that sort of thing to happen. I, and, and I bet there's nobody who, even if they believe Rice and Poindexter, Mondo and Poindexter did this, uh, that they would believe that they could find any other court case in this state or in this country that allowed something like that to occur. Kitcher, we didn't give you a chance to, to answer that question uh, last time we were up, and that is, were you surprised what you found once you started doing your research into this case? Um, well, I was... It's a little overwhelming because there are so many details and the case has gone on for so long. There's a lot of post-conviction uh, stuff. I was overwhelmed by, by the evidence and um, it, begin, it begins to be very difficult to sort through it and, and to keep track of all the details. And what was the most interesting thing to me, I was just down at the courthouse today reading some uh, depositions and, and things, and it's interesting to note the, um, the way a person's testimony starts out this way in a police report. And then in a statement, it gets massaged a little bit and changed a little bit. And then by the time the person testifies in court, the testimony is, is different from what it was the first time. And so there, there's an evolution to their testimony where facts continue to be changed as the person continues to testify and, uh, and and that's difficult to keep track of because when you want to say so-and-so said this so-and-so and this is not just Dwayne Peake this is a number of individuals so-and-so says a different thing depending upon what document you're reading and uh, I, I'm a newcomer to this. I, I, I've not done a lot of research into legal cases, and so um, in terms of was I surprised by what I found, um, yes, I was, primarily because I was new to it, but uh, I, my heart really breaks for everybody in this situation, for Mondo and Ed, as well as the Minard family, as well as, you know, Patrolman Tess, because I think people are, um, there's, there's no communication, you know, and uh, I can see, you know, how anybody looking at the, the different documents would come to different conclusions because um, it's, uh, it, I'm sorry, I, I just got a little incoherent there. <laughs> well, <that's okay>. well, <laughs> I lost my point. Well, that's all right, because what we <laughs> want to do now, I mean, there, there is a question how others see this case, and one answer is found in a documentary produced and aired by the British Broadcasting Company in 1991. This is a part of that program. My partner and I had just finished a little, uh, like a lunch break. We never really went out of service. We just ate while we were on duty. Um, got a big plate of barbecued ribs and sat in the projects and, you know, right in the area and ate them and uh, heard a call come out of a woman screaming. A woman screaming for help, possible rape in progress at an address at 28th and Ohio. I didn't see anybody leaving the house or I didn't see anybody in the alley. And I walked over to the window and I was peeking in the window. 
when I saw Officer Kess and Officer Menard walking from the kitchen to the front door area. And we kind of worked our way through the rooms. I could tell where he was because of the flashlight. And Larry was about, I'm guessing, 10, 12 feet in front of me. And he had bent over the suitcase, and that's the last I remember of, of that. I don't like to see somebody get by who are murdering somebody. And uh, just plain and simple. You know, when you're investigating homicide, there's a saying that you are uh, in that man's shoes to see that he gets justice. And I always did believe that. You know, how is that dead man going to get justice if you don't do it for him? Well, that's my principle. A week after the bombing, Officer Larry Minard was buried. The police were convinced the Black Panthers were responsible for the killing. We were under constant surveillance, constant harassment. Uh, a great deal of energy and uh, <clears throat> resources were spent uh, on trying to provoke us into a confrontation. One, you know, involving shooting, of course. Uh, we, couldn't leave, uh, we couldn't leave a building and enter the streets without being frisked, uh, harassed. Uh, this went on around the clock. Not a night went by, man, that somebody wasn't absolutely, totally, unnecessarily pounced upon by the police. Not a night went by, man. This was like seven days a week. The Black Panthers published a newsletter called Freedom by Any Means Necessary. David Rice was the editor. And we're talking about all the people and we're serious about this. Then we're talking about urban guerrilla warfare. And we're talking about people using their brains. And you don't use your brain by throwing some bottles and some bricks and some pigs and getting some cruises. You off the pig by the means that are available to you, which can be easily obtained. Both David Rice and Ed Poindexter were visible in the community. And uh, David Rice was uh, very free about what he thought the answer to these problems were, and they generally included killing police officers. Uh, Ed Poindexter, not as vocal, was always present, always around. Marvin McClarity was one of the few black police officers in Omaha at that time. I knew I had feelings that they were out to get those two because they were probably the most, uh, the, the two that were most vocal. They were the two that uh, people viewed as being a threat, the police did. Well, there wasn't a policeman on the job that didn't know who done that. It was just a matter of being able to prove it. And that's what we've done. A week after the bombing, officers Jim Perry and Jack Swanson led a raid on David Rice's house in North Omaha. Rice was in Kansas City giving a speech at the time. He'd left his house unlocked. Both Jim Perry and Jack Swanson later testified they found a box of dynamite in the basement. Other officers aren't so sure. Marvin McClarity is convinced the dynamite was planted after the area had been cordoned off. I was on duty. We saw them bringing uh, items out of that house. The thing that was so striking to me and to those uh, two officers that I was with was the fact that the police had blocked off uh, 29th to 30th on Parker Street, and they blocked it off to vehicular traffic and to pedestrian traffic. Then they said they found something in that house, and. Uh, Lee and the police officer, the first thing strikes you is funny and saying, hey, something's wrong here because of the way that that search was conducted. And uh, that was when we drew our suspicions that it could have been something that was planted in that house. And uh, to this day, I still believe that was planted in that house. It's a lie. I was there. I found it. Uh, I didn't uh, personally discover it, 
but I was there when it was discovered and went right to where it was. <laughs> it was there. Although the police had the dynamite they claimed to have found in David Rice's house, they lacked any firm evidence to link Rice to the bombing. The next stage in the investigation came when the police were tipped off that one of the bombers was a teenager called Dwayne Peake. Acting on information developed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, agents of the FBI and investigators of the Omaha Police Division arrested Dwayne Peake, charging him with first degree murder in the bombing death of patrolman Larry D. Menard. According to Dwayne Peake's uncle, once he was in custody, he told the police he'd made the bomb with members of his family. According to his uncle, the police weren't interested in Dwayne Peake's story. They put pressure on him to implicate Rice and Poindexter in the bombing. Once he was arrested, he was like a whip puppy, and he, uh, according to uh, what they told me, he readily told them everything about what had happened and how it happened. And he was a young kid, he was only, I think, six, 15, 16 years old. A police mentality is when, once you hone in on a suspect, uh, you do all you can to bring that to, uh, to court and to, for the conviction. And sometimes we take shortcuts uh, in order to convict someone, and sometimes we just do things that are just right down dishonest. And I think that uh, once they, uh, they honed in on David and, uh, and Edward, that they just carried through and, uh, and did it that way. After changing his story several times, Duane finally told the police it was Rice and Poindexter who'd made the bomb. He claimed the bomb had been made in David Rice's kitchen after Poindexter had brought a box of dynamite up from the basement. Duane also claimed Ed Poindexter told him to plant the bomb at an empty house in North Omaha. He went on to say, Poindexter gave him instructions to call the police to the house by dialing the emergency number from a payphone. On the basis of Duane's evidence, the police decided to charge Rice and Poindexter with the bombing. Many months later, in a wave of publicity, the murder trial was held. According to prosecuting attorney Sam Cooper, Dwayne Peake was the key to the prosecution case. The physical evidence, the, the dynamite, uh, that's all we would have had, I think, without Dwayne Peake. And I suspect it would have been questionable whether you could have filed it. It's pretty clear that absent the testimony of Dwayne Peake, it would have been a weak circumstantial case of murder. I mean, he was critical to the case. Dwayne Peake's appearance in court as a witness was eagerly awaited. His was the only evidence which directly linked Rice and Poindexter to the bombing. Dwayne Peake was called to the stand as a witness for the prosecution. His testimony stunned the court. But when he testified in the morning, uh, he denied any involvement on my part or Ed regarding the whole question of, of talking about a bombing or, or, or constructing a bomb or any of this. And um, I guess my reaction was, damn, this little dude is stronger than I could have guessed because I, I know they've done some things to him or said some things to him that would scare the hell out of him. But somehow, He's not going along with the program. Uh, with those uh, shocking disclosures, shocking to the prosecution, the proceedings ended. Uh, at the request of the prosecutor who asked that the preliminary hearing be continued to the afternoon. Afternoon proceedings occurred. Dwayne Peake comes in wearing sunglasses, looking visibly shaken, changed. I asked Dwayne Peake to take off his sunglasses. His face around the eyes was swollen 
It looked discolored to me. His eyes were red. It was clear he'd been crying. And my impression at the time was that he had been struck physically, and that's what caused the discoloration and the marks around his eyes. When he took the glasses off, people in the courtroom let out an audible gasp. Dwayne Christopher Peake had been worked on, really worked on, between the morning session and the afternoon session. It was frightening to see what happened to that young man. After Duane's changed testimony, the court session ended. That night, he wrote a letter home. They had me in court today. I guess you already know that by now. The Lord knows I tried, but something happened which forced me to realize that I had no alternative but to say what I said. Mama, I'm going through hell. I don't know what to do or how to do it or what to say or how to say it. I can't find the words to say to the people, I'm sorry. Most likely, they'll probably prefer that I just die. I don't think I'll mind that at all. With love always, Dwayne C.P. The trial continued with the introduction of forensic evidence. After their arrest, Rice and Poindexter's hands had been tested for traces of explosives. These tests were negative. However, the prosecution's forensic expert claimed that dust particles in their clothes had tested positive for the presence of dynamite. But on cross-examination, he admitted that the tests carried out might not have been exclusively for dynamite. In fact, they could have registered positive from a range of other substances. To lend weight to his case, the prosecutor claimed that Ed Poindexter was an explosives expert who'd served in Vietnam. This was untrue. I was, I was a medical aid man most of that time, and then I was a mechanic. You know, no experience with explosives. You know, that was just, again, you know, uh, the press is um, uh, uh, in the FBI and the police department working in concert. That was their way of, of uh, making me look as, a, as, a, as bad as possible, you know. This guy must have done such a thing, because look at him, you know. He looks like one of these big, uh, burly, black, he got a beard where it's shaved, you know. He's, he's, he's a Vietnam veteran. He must have done it. After all the evidence had been heard, Ed Poindexter and David Rice were found guilty. Well, of course, uh, police officers in that situation are always going to think about the death penalty. Uh, at that time, that was not possible in Nebraska. The maximum sentence available was, was life, is, which, uh, is what uh, Rice and Poindexter both received. I was expecting it, but then, you know, there's no way you can pray can can, can prepare yourself emotionally for something like that, you know. David Rice and Edward Poindexter are still in jail. In Nebraska, there is no parole in life sentences. Dwayne Peake, who testified against them, spent four years in youth custody and was released in 1974. He then disappeared. However, 20 years on, new evidence has emerged. At the trial, Dwayne Peake testified he telephoned the police on Ed Poindexter's instructions. Members of his family now maintain it was not Dwayne who called the police. All emergency calls are recorded as a matter of course. But in the early 1970s, the Omaha police claimed the only tape recording of Dwayne Peake's call had been destroyed. But in fact, the operator on duty on the night of the bombing made his own copy of the call. When he died recently, this tape turned up in Omaha. This tape was played to people who remembered Dwayne's voice. Now, I had listened to Dwayne Christopher Peake testify for almost three days before the jury. 
I had taken two sets of depositions. I had sat with this young man for hours listening to him describe uh, his actions, his contentions, his recollections, and heard his voice and was saturated with his voice. It is my opinion now that the voice on that tape was not Dwayne Christopher Peek. When I heard this tape and realized that the deep voice of a much older man that I heard on this tape was the one they were saying was the voice of Dwayne Peake, this 15-year-old kid whose voice I knew, I couldn't believe it. Anybody who heard that tape would have to know that the whole story about Dwayne Peake having made a phone call to lure the police to that house would have known it was a lie. If the voice on the tape is not Dwayne Peake's, it's clear he was lying on oath. These newly obtained documents show the FBI was well aware of this perjury. The Omaha police and the FBI deliberately arranged for the tape recording to be suppressed because, in their words, it would be prejudicial to the case against Rice and Poindexter. In other words, they knew Peake was lying. Uh, we feel we got the two main players uh, in Rice and Poindexter. And uh, I think we did the right thing at the time because the Black Panther Party or whatever, by whatever name it was going by at the time of the, uh, of the murder, completely disappeared from the city of Omaha. Everybody disassociated itself from the Black Panther Party or their uh, new names. And uh, it's sort of been the end of that sort of thing in the city of Omaha, and that's uh, 21 years ago. After the imprisonment of so many of its leaders, the Black Panthers were effectively crushed as a political force in America. COINTELPRO, the FBI's counterintelligence program which helped destroy the Panthers, came to an end with the resignation of President Nixon. But almost 20 years on, its victims remain in jail. Treat Dad to a gift from Menard. He'll love power tools from Makita. Finishing sanders to $39.87. Cordless drill kits come with two battery packs, charger and tool case, $119. Tackle a wide range of cleanups with shop back cleaners. One gallon models to $23.96. 16 gallon models come with handy accessories, $89.95. For great Father's Day gifts, shop Menard. Save big money at Menards. Other people want to talk about how they've, they've suffered and how family members have suffered. I got a family too. You know, my mama just turned 80. Uh, people think she hasn't suffered having her son locked up in the joint all this time. People can be very, you know, people can have uh, very intense tunnel vision. I can see my suffering but I can't see yours. I can see my uninformed truth, but I can't see yours. Now, of course, research into the case continues even today. In fact, uh, there is some new information which came to light very recently, and Kitrin, you're very uh, instrumental in this. And I should mention again, Kitrin uh, uh, Zeichel and uh, Ben Gray are with us. Kitrin, the researcher, Ben, one of my colleagues here at Channel 7. But what we want to do, we want to show a photo that uh, was actually taken uh, by the Omaha World Herald and appeared uh, in the local newspaper. And uh, it, 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 it uh, if we could show, well, we, you probably can't see it there, but uh, this picture, which was taken, again, uh, it was taken at, again, when he turned himself in mm -hmm. at, at police headquarters and was very important. Uh, explain why. Well, I was writing a summary of the case, and I was going over the testimony of Kenneth Snow, who was the ATF chemist who uh, 
examined the pants and claimed that he found dynamite in the right front pants pocket of David Rice's pants. And he testified that you took a cotton swab and you run it over their hands and it's wet and it's no more complicated than washing your hand because it's wet it picks up particles of dynamite. Well immediately after that photograph was taken David Rice went upstairs he turned his clothes over to the police. Now if you and the uh, chemist also testified that there was a chunk of dynamite in his right front pants pocket that was visible to the naked eye. He did not even have to put it under a microscope to tell that it was dynamite. Now, David Rice's hands did not test positive for dynamite, but the pants did. If you take your hands and you shove them in your pocket, his hands, his hands are shoved in his pockets there, and your hands are hot and sweaty and wet on an August day, and your pants have so much dynamite in them that it's visible to the naked eye, you would have to transfer those dynamite particles to your hands. Your hands should test positive. But neither David Rice nor Edward Poindexter's hands tested positive for dynamite. And that photograph intuitively serves as a kind of proof that someone must have put that dynamite in his pants pockets after the pants were turned over to the authorities because his hands would have been just, you know, he, they would have been a wash in dynamite. So at least it would have been a red flag. I mailed that photograph to Mondo last spring I think it was and he wrote back to me and he said you know when you sent me that photograph something just went right through me because evidently in all these years nobody ever noticed the photograph and nobody ever brought it up to um, to challenge the evidence that uh, dynamite had been put in their pants. And again this is a picture which appeared in the Omaha World Herald and if a person really had any questions about it, all they had to do was look at the corner of the Herald and But take nobody a look ever at made it. the connection or used it as a you know, to challenge the evidence. So what is happening now? I mean, we've, we've heard about the, the effort to get uh, the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee uh, to investigate the COINTEL probe and its possible involvement in, uh, in, the, in the Rice and Poindexter case. But, but what else is happening right now with these two cases? Well, Ed and I have written a video which goes over some of the evidence that we haven't even covered here. He basically looks at all of the evidence against them, the wire, the pliers, the dynamite in the house. He goes over the search in the video. He goes over this photograph, the dynamite in the pants, and he goes over the testimony of Dwayne Peak, and he lays it all out, and he tears the evidence apart. And at the end of that, he says to people, you know, I am not guilty of this thing, and I want to do what I was obstructed from doing in Douglas County Court. I want to prove my innocence. And what he would like is for all of the files to be released, not just on this bomb, but on a series of bombings that happened in the Midwest. And that's something that's very rarely covered in the papers either, is that there was a string of bombings in Iowa, Nebraska, and Minneapolis. I believe on exactly the same night that Officer Menard was murdered, uh, the federal building in Minneapolis was blown up with dynamite. Big columns, you know, cement columns were blown across the street by this blast. And uh, I would like to know if these bombings were related, and if they were related, is it possible that the parties who were responsible for those bombings were actually responsible for this bombing as well? And the reason that I think there's a possibility of that is because of the triggering device on the bomb that was used to kill Officer Menard. It was a close pin triggering device. And I've talked to some people who have more uh, uh, experience doing this kind of research who know more about these things. A close pin triggering device is incredibly unstable. That wedge of wood can just snap out of there very easily and then the connection is made and the thing explodes. And there was a bomb found in Iowa in June under a highway overpass which was a toolbox which had exactly the same kind of close pin triggering device in it. So it's, it's entirely possible that somebody else was making these bombs in the Midwest and that this bombing could be traced to those people if we could get a hold of the, the files on these other bombings. And and that's a part of what uh, the, the purpose of calling for these congressional hearings. And it's not just about this case. There is a movement afoot to have what is called truth and reconciliation hearings or a truth and reconciliation commission like they have in South Africa or had in South Africa, where the police or the FBI would come forward and say, yes, these are the things that we did to, co to uh, convict these activists who we wanted to get rid of and then they are not prosecuted if they will simply come forward and tell the truth. So there are, evidently there are something like 300 political prisoners in this country or people who consider themselves political prisoners who were framed for crimes that they say they did not commit. And so what people are looking to do now is forge a coalition amongst all of those prisoners to call as a group for Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Rice Point Extra case would be one of those cases that would be covered by this. And this is what they will be approaching the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Congress with. It's not just the Rice Poindexter case, it's a lot of cases. And now that Geronimo Pratt has been released from jail, we're hoping that that will start the snowball rolling so that, um, so that everything that is hidden will be made known, as it says in the Bible. <laughs> yeah. And then the Geronimo Pratt case, I mean, I think it's, uh, Kitchen made a good point. It, this is about a lot of different cases. It's not just about the, the Mondo Poindexter case. 
Um, and Geronimo Pratt is, is one of those individuals. I don't think he's been released yet. He's right now in a bureaucratic black hole. At least so at the time that we're taking At the that. time, we're, yeah, he hasn't <laughs> been released yet. But uh, Geronimo Pratt was also considered a Black Panther, member of the Black Panther Party. Uh, he was framed under certain circumstances. FBI was involved. The same sort of circumstances that exist in the in the Mondo Poindexter case. And I sort of and and Johnny Cochran is the attorney on that case. And I I read portions of Johnny Cochran's book, and I sort of felt the same way when we started out. Johnny Cochran started out as a new attorney in this case, and and so forth. And he didn't, you know, he had he was a novice. He believed certain things about the police. He, I, there were some problems with police, but he thought basically things were okay, and then he got into this case and found out there were some problems. Um, and I sort of felt the same way, and, 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 and that's where we are right now with this case. But, but you know, when we talk about that, obviously, it's, it's not going to be an easy task to get these no. hearings. I mean, a number of people have already come out in opposition, among them, the, for instance, in this case, the minor family said they are very opposed to having uh, the Senate step in and, and, and launch an investigation. Does that surprise you, either of you? It, it doesn't surprise me, I think, but I think that they, um, you know, again, you know, people, I, I agree with Kitchen when she says that people look at it and, and they bring their own truth to it to a certain extent. And, and their truth is not necessarily Mondo's truth or not necessarily our truth or whatever the case may be. But if you look strictly at the evidence, strictly at what ought to have been questioned by legal scholars and those in the, in the legal profession, there are obviously some flaws and some questions that need to be dealt with. Two men have been in jail for 27 years because of those questions going unanswered. Why do you think this particular case, though, continues to be so controversial? Again, I think it's, I'll, I'll let you, you start <laughs> off. <laughs> I'm going to say something that's going to get me in trouble with Mondo's defense committee and a lot of liberals out there, and I include myself among the liberals, but uh, once I was in Ernie Chambers' office talking to him about the case, and I said to him, I think if you're going to run around town talking about killing police officers and writing articles about killing police officers, you should expect to be the prime suspect when a police officer gets killed. And uh, to my surprise, Ernie Chambers pointed to me and said, you're absolutely right. <laughs> and so I think the reason that this case continues to generate the kind of feeling that it does is because of those writings, because people don't understand them, because people don't remember the time, people don't remember the death of Vivian Strong, people don't remember why North Omaha burned in 1969, they don't remember how the community felt, they don't remember the kind of tension that existed between the black community and the police back then. These writings did not come out of a vacuum. You know, they did not, you know, just appear for no reason whatsoever. There was an incredible amount of tension between the two sides, and there was a lot of machismo nonsense. You know, there was a lot of posturing, and there was, as today, there was a lot of lack of communication amongst both sides. And so, for me, that's what I think it's, it's about. The, the feeling that it generates is because nobody is able to put themselves into the shoes of the other person and understand how that person felt at the time. And all of that hostility that was expressed on both sides between the police and the Black Panthers um, is completely misunderstood. And, uh, and that's why I think it continues to generate Ben, you're going to have the final word here. you got about a minute. <laughs> uh, they, one of the things I did want to say is that there are a number of police officers. I mean, this is not an attack on police officers or on the FBI as a whole or anyone like that. Most police officers, most FBI officers, uh, most people who are, who are involved in law enforcement try to do a credible job and in many instances do do that. But there are people who for whatever reason, whether they feel it's for the betterment of the government, whether they feel it's for the betterment of people, whether, they, whether they're malicious um, and, and whatever, they, they do things that go beyond the scope of what they are allowed to do. And that's what I think happened in this particular case and because of that we have an obligation as journalists as people who believe in justice to look at this case. Okay. Then that, like I said, that is going to be our final word. Ben, thank you for being with us. Kitrin, thank you. And thank you. That's all of our time. Again, thank you for joining us during this special hour edition of Kaleidoscope. As Ben would say, we hope you've learned something valuable. Kaleidoscope will return next week at its regular time. Kaleidoscope has been sponsored by the Afro-American Bookstore.